In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, we gather together and we'll be celebrating July the 4th um, and really enjoying the beauty and wonder of our country. As, as you probably know, Tessa and I were married in South Africa and then we came over, we immigrated to the United States, we studied and then we came later and immigrated in 1987 and have been a part of this country and later became citizens and are so proud to be Americans in this country. And you know, one of the things that I have always valued when I was, first came over here was that we came from a country of such division, the apartheid era that we had, which means the separate is what was upheld. And so they were separating our country, and that was the legislation that we had. And it was so painful. And you were either for the government or against the government. And there was a sharp division of what we had in our country. And when we came over here, I was so thankful. We were part of the United States of America. And you had Republicans and Democrats, but you know, we were united as a country, and I was always so proud to be a part of that. I don't know if I've just been here for so long now, or I'm getting older, but I'm just so aware of increasingly how divided we seem to be in our land as opposed to the focus being on our being united, it's like you're a Republican or you're a Democrat, and if you're one of those, you're over here. And it's so sad. It's so unfortunate to have this division in our country, and my urging, and it's up to us and all of the politicians, is that we reclaim what it is to be the united, States of America. That's who we need to be. Well, so much for my politics. Let's move on to the scriptures. I want to make three points with you um, today. I want to give two points from our Old Testament reading and then one point from the gospel reading. You know, when you listen to the Old Testament reading, with Abraham and Isaac, you listen and you think to yourself like, really? I mean, if he did that today in this country, he'd be arrested. They would, they would be separated. They would not be able to continue like that at all. But we're going to go back to that time and to what was taking place and focus particularly on how Abraham had to tackle some of the issues that were there before him. And the first point that I want to make is that God might not give us the guidance that we expect. God might not give us the guidance that we expect. So there's the beginning of the scripture, and there's Abraham possibly saying his morning prayers, and he's out there trying to talk to God, and suddenly God speaks to him and calls his name. And he says, yes, Lord, here I am. Praise you, Lord. Thank you for everything that you do for me. All praise be to you, Lord God. And God says, that's wonderful, Abraham. Thank you. He says, but I'd like you to do something for me. And Abraham says, sure. You tell me. I'm with you. I'm your loyal servant, Lord. And God says, well, I want you to take your son, and I want you to go on this long walk, and I want you to sacrifice him for me. And Abraham goes, uh, the communications got lost. I mean, I was in a good link with you, but something happened, and we just got separated. What, what were you saying, Lord? You're saying that I, my son and I need to go for a long walk and to make a sacrifice to you. And God says, kind of. 
It's just that I want you to sacrifice your son for me. And you can just imagine what Abraham went through. And the point that I want to uphold is that at times we have these incredible expectations of what God will say to us. And at times in our planning, and appropriately, and I know for myself it has been a matter of, Lord, I believe I'm called to go in this direction, and I'm needing some confirmation from you to assure me that that is where I need to go. And at times that's right, and at times God says, "Uh uh-uh, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go here. And that's hard. And we have to be listening, and we have to be faithful. But sometimes God tells us to move in a very different direction. So God might not give us the guidance that we expect. The second thing is that sometimes God answers us at the last moment. Sometimes God answers us at the last moment. So there's Abraham, and God's just said, I want you to take your son and to sacrifice him for me. And so what we read is that the next day he gets up, and he gets some of the servants to go with him and his son. And the two of them head off on this long walk. And you can just imagine, like, okay, Lord, this is two hours now. Say something, say something. Uh, You told me what to do, I followed you, we're doing it. We've been walking for two hours. I want to hear something from you. Nothing, nothing. And he goes for two days, and then it's the third day. He's shown the mountain that he has to go to. That's a long walk. Three days, that's about from here to Dallas. I mean, a fairly lengthy walk. And yet, he continues, and you can just imagine what's going through his mind the whole time. Come on, Lord, come on. And finally, they get told the spot that they have to go to. He leaves the servants behind, and he and his son head off together. And his son says, okay, Dad, this this has been fun. It's been a long walk. But we're doing good. So where's this lamb that we're going to sacrifice? The neighbor of him says, "Mm, we'll, we'll get there. But you know, there's that waiting all the time for God to give us some direction. And what we discover, of course, is right at the very last moment, as he's about to sacrifice his son, that he's told it's okay. What I want us to hold on to is that it sometimes takes a long time. And we very appropriately say we want it done quickly. But God might not answer for a long, long, long time. Hold on. Don't give up. Don't say, oh, that's it. I'll head in a different direction. Stay there and wait and wait. So God might not give us the guidance that we expect. And sometimes God answers us at the last moment. And then the final point is totally different. It's from the gospel reading. And it's simply this. Welcome. Welcome. That gospel reading, which I read, it just impacts you. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of the prophet, whoever welcomes a righteous person, he goes on and on and on about welcoming. And it's so important for us to take the initiative and to do the welcoming. It's so easy for us to just in our daily lives, and particularly in our church life, to just cozy up to those whom we know and are friendly with, and that's good. 
But it's so important that we look beyond ourselves and we reach out and we do the welcoming. You know, this church, St. Cuthbert, is fantastic at the welcoming. I've seen it and others have seen it as well. And I just want to urge us to continue to hold that as an integral part of our personal and our church life. I think I might have shared with you at one time the story from when I was um, in the Diocese of Chicago. And the Bishop of Chicago at that time, Frank Griswold, um, he later became the presiding bishop, <clears throat> but Frank Griswold was the bishop. And I remember going to a service at one time where he spoke and he said that he was so used to coming in as a bishop. And he would walk in and everyone would run around him and, yes, bishop, yes, bishop, yes, bishop, and here's this bishop, and here's this, and here's this, and have some coffee afterwards, bishop, and have some lunch, and have some breakfast, and have some, you know, these are all the people, these are the best three, these are, you know, and on and on and on. And he said it was wonderful. And he said what he did one Sunday, he didn't have anything on, and he decided just to go to one of the churches and to sit in the pew. And he said he sat in the pew and no one said anything. And he sat there and went through the service and came out and everyone was all huddled together in their little different groups. And he stood there and he had a cup of coffee. And then he got in his car and drove home. It's so different. And I want us to be really aware of other people and to initiate the welcoming as much as we can. This is such a wonderful church, St. Cuthbert, and we can welcome people here. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and confess our faith together in the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> 